Prime Center, but Dr. Abdullah is well known as a good presenter and he has a well established here for two and it is available and I think you will uh, you will find the the link for NIFOTUBE we will present it to you. Dr. Abdullah is famous by his nice presentations and algorithms. Today he will discuss the issue of anticoagulation in dialysis. Dr. Abdullah. Thank you, Professor Hussein. Uh, Actually, I will talk about immunosis and coagulation. It is one of the most important topics uh, that we meet in our practice. Uh, it is a very large topic to be covered in one lecture. Okay. Starting by the most uh, or the well-known extrinsic and intrinsic uh, clotting pathways that occur normally in our body for the formation of blood clot starting by many of inactive proteases in our body that are activated in a sequence for the formation of blood clot. In hemodialysis patients, the precipitating factor that activates both intrinsic and extrinsic pathways is the contact of the patient's blood with the hemodialysis filter. This is why our patients on hemodialysis are at high risk for coagulation and for clotting during hemodialysis session. This is my talk outline regarding the different anticoagulation procedures that can be used during the hemodialysis session. There are heparin-related anticoagulant mechanisms, citrate-related and others. I will talk in depth regarding the heparin-related anticoagulants and I will talk in short regarding the other anticoagulant methods. Starting by the heparin-related anticoagulants, the most famous and the most commonly used heparin-related anticoagulant is the unfractionated heparin. The site of action of unfractionated heparin is by blocking the activated factor 10 and blocking of activated factor 2, which is the thrombin, Actually, an unfractionated heparin acting by forming a complex with the circulating antithrombin 3. The unfractionated antithrombin complex attached to the in, to the activated factor 10 and inactivated it. Also, the lens of the unfractionated heparin is long enough or tall enough to combine also to the activated factor 2 from it and inactivate it. This is how unfractionated heparin inactivate both factor 10 and thrombin factor 2. Many heparin administration methods are available. Uh, actually, there is no ideal method or highly recommended method for the use of heparin. All methods are uh, different centers of experiences. Generally, they are divided into three major methods, method A, B, and C. All of them started by initial bolus of heparin at the start of the dialysis session. Method A and method B using routine heparin initial bolus, which is a large initial bolus dose. Method C using a small dose initial bolus called the tight heparin. Then they continued, they continued the dialysis session method A and method B by constant infusion heparin. Method B continued by one of two methods, by repeated bolus, mini boluses after the initial bolus, or they only give the initial bolus without any further doses. Starting by method A, Initial bolus followed by constant methods infusion. Different protocols are available. As I said, there is no ideal protocol. Some centers are using unfractionated heparin during intermittent hemodialysis using an initial bolus of 2,000 international unit, following by infusion dose of 1,200 international unit per hour. The European Renal Practice Guidelines recommending initial bolus dose of 50 international unit per kilogram followed by 800 to 1,500 international unit per hour. If the heparin is used for CRRT, one of the most famous recommendations is to use 
30 international units per kilogram as initial bolus, followed by about 5 to 10 international units per kilogram per hour for infusion dose all over the session of dialysis, targeting activated partial thromboplastin time to be 1.5 to double the normal times. Do we need to monitor the heparin clotting tests during the heparin uh, usage? Do we have to repeat the activated partial uh, uh, thromboplastin time to monitor the level of heparin in the patient's body? Actually, in practice, therapy is ordinarily uh, done without monitoring of coagulation. And if we are afraid because the patient is of or is at a risk of bleeding, actually we use heparin-free dialysis. So in practice, actually there is no one using the clotting test to monitor the heparin in our hemodialysis patients. Although it may be written in some texts and some articles. Regarding the second method, which is using the routine heparin at the start, followed by repeated boluses or only the first initial bolus, Different protocols are available. Some centers use 4,000 international units as initial bolus, followed by subsequent repeated bolus when needed if they felt that the, there is some clotting in the hemodialysis filter or machine order lines. This is my own center experience. We start with 2,000 international units as initial bolus, followed by 1,000 international units at the beginning of each hour or at the start of each hour of the hemodialysis and some centers use 2,000 international units at the initial bolus without no repeated boluses. Regarding the tight heparin method, it actually it is not popular and it is not used that enough. Its indication is mainly in patients who are at slight risk of bleeding. Actually, if, it is, if there is a slight risk of bleeding or moderate to severe, we prefer mainly to avoid heparin as anticoagulant. So it is mainly used in patients with slight risk for bleeding. How it is used? They obtain a baseline clotting time, followed by initial bolus dose 750 international unit. Then they recheck clotting time after 30 minutes, uh, sorry, three minutes. If they didn't reach desired clotting time, they administer another supplemental bolus dose 750 international unit. If the exact clotting time is reached, they start the dialysis with heparin infusion at a rate of 600 international units. This is a minimum dose, five dose of using heparin. Then they monitor the clotting time every 30 minutes. It is sophisticated and it is considered as a headache for the nursing staff and the doctors in the hemodialysis unit. So it's better to avoid heparin totally in patients with any level of risk of bleeding. Okay, if there is clotting in spite of use of anticoagulant, even heparin or others, if that means that I am not using the sufficient dose of heparin, yes, maybe yes, but don't always blame heparin, because there are many other causes that cause clotting of the circulating, the, the hemodialysis system, even when, if you are using the correct dose of heparin. So don't always blame heparin, there are many other causes, for example, retained air in the dialyzer, inadequate priming of the line and the filters, kinking of the dialyzer and the line, vascular access, inadequate blood flow, recirculation, or repeated interruption of the blood flow due to repeated machine alarms and the nursing to stop the machine several times. And surely, if there is a problem within the heparin administration. So heparin is one of the many causes of the clotting of the filter and the line of the machine. Okay. But if there is recurrent clotting and I excluded all other causes, so we have to readjust and re-evaluate all uh, our heparin dose. What are the main complications of heparinization? First of all is bleeding. Incidence of bleeding is about two, uh, 10 to 50 percent. Mortality due to bleeding is as high as 15 percent. The risk of bleeding is proportional to the activated partial plastin time and not to the heparin dose, so it may be individualized in our patients. Not all patients may receive the same dose of heparin. One of the most important causes of bleeding, if 
or one of the most common manifestations of bleeding is post therapy needle puncture site. After you remove the needle from your patient after the hemodialysis, you have a continuous bleeding which is prolonged. Many of us assume because the patient has overdose of heparin during the dialysis session, but again, don't always bleed heparin. Because there are many other causes and important and common to cause the same presentation. Yes, you have to evaluate your heparin dose, but don't forget that outflow stenosis of the vascular axis is one of the most common post needle puncture side bleeding due to high pressure, which delay the occlusion of the needle. And again, evaluate your nursing needle insertion technique. The second complication of heparin is heparin new from Cytopenia is a large topic. I will cover it in very short uh, words. Heparin used from Cytopenia is heparin exposure plus from Cytopenia plus minus thrombosis. The main cause is due to IgG antibodies that are formed against the platelet factor 4 heparin complex. The main management is to stop heparin, even unfractionated or normally heparin that I will talk about, and start non-heparin anticoagulants. This is in short, I recommend for you one of my lectures, which is heparin induced thrombocytopenia on the FOTU website. I will put the link at the end of the lecture that I talk it in depth and in details in the causes and the management and the dosing of anticoagulants in heparin induced thrombocytopenia. Other heparin associated complications hyperlipidemia and lipid disturbance, hyperkalemia, reported cases with pruritus, reported cases with anaphylactoid reaction, especially with first use, reported cases of osteoporosis, and reported cases of alopecia. This is regarding unfractionated heparin, regarding low molecular weight heparin. Low molecular weight heparin has a lower or smaller molecular weight than unfractionated heparin. Actually, low molecular weight heparin is formed from unfractionated heparin by enzymatic degradation. The main site of action of low molecular weight heparin is mainly by inhibiting activity factor 10 and the slight weak effect against thrombin. This is because the length of low molecular weight heparin is short. So, when it forms a complex with antithrombin, this complex is long enough to inactivate factor 10, but it is not long enough to, an e to inactivate thrombin activated factor 2. So this is why it has a good anti-factor 10 activity, but a weak anti-thrombin activity. Regarding the comparison between no low molecular weight heparin and the unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin has a longer life, more rapid onset of action, higher bioavailability, more predictable effects, less non-specific binding to endothelium and the platelets, less platelets and leukocyte activation, and it has no antidote. It is not reversible with glutamine sulfate as unfractionated heparin. Regarding side effects, it has less risk of heparin-induced osteoporosis, it has less bleeding and less thrombocytopenia, but heat heparin is strong, so it can make an okay with low molecular weight heparin, less hyperkalemia, less disturbance of lipid profile, and anaphylactoid first dose as unfractionated heparin. Regarding the most important two complications for the comparison between low molecular weight and unfractionated heparin are bleeding and thrombosis. This is one of the most important meta-analysis comparing low molecular weight heparin and unfractionated heparin regarding a bleeding as a major uh, side effect. There was no difference between low molecular weight heparin and the unfractionated heparin regarding a bleeding from vascular axis. Also, they compared both drugs regarding thrombosis. There was no difference between low molecular weight heparin and unfractionated heparin regarding the incidence of thrombosis of the extracorporeal circuit. This is why the European Renal Practice Guidelines recommend low molecular weight heparins as the first preferred line for, uh, to be used as an anticoagulant during hemodialysis than unfractionated heparin. But actually, low molecular weight heparin are very expensive, and as they are not superior to unfractionated heparin, Unfractionated heparin is widely used here and uh, in Mansoura and uh, in my city, Alexandria. The most commonly used in is unfractionated heparin because it is of low cost in relation to low molecular heparin. 
If I use, if I will use low molecular weight temperament for intermittent hemodialysis, there is different dosing for different drugs. But the main idea is that they have longer half-life, so single dose as a start of dialysis is efficient and sufficient. If there is extended dialysis session, splitting the dose is important. Regarding CRRT, can I use low molecular weight heparin? It is not widely used in CRRT. And even it has no reduced bleeding or increased filter survival and very low uh, experience for the use of low molecular weight in heparin in CRRT all over the world. How to be monitored? It is not monitored by activated partial thromboplastin pump, it is activated by antifactor 10E, which also is not available and difficult to be obtained. So this is one of the drawbacks to the use of low molecular weight heparin. One of the most important related anticoagulant method is heparin free dials, not to use heparin. When, to use, when not to use heparin, if the patient is high risk of bleeding, for example, if it's pericarditis, recent surgery, coagulopathy disease, thrombocytopenia, intracerebral hemorrhage, active bleeding, and even there are some centers that use heparin free dialysis as the main protocol for anticoagulation for hemodialysis patients. I think here in the uh, urology and the center in Mansoura, they are using the heparin free dialysis even if the patient is not at risk of bleeding. How to use this method? Start by heparin rinse, rinse extracorporeal circuit with saline containing 2,000 to 500 units of heparin. Then drain the heparin containing the priming fluid from your machine out of the dialysis machine by unheparinized saline. Then set the blood flow rate at 250 to 500 ml per minute. And the periodic means periodic washing of the hemodialysis filter and the machine during the dialysis session by about 50 to 250 ml saline every 15 to 30 minutes. The first step is optional, especially if the patient has heparin induced thrombocytopenia, so I may avoid. And the periodic lens is important to follow up the hollow fibers if there is a clotting fibers that appear, so the lens must be of a larger volume and more frequent. If I use the heparin free analysis for CRRT, it is better to use the pre dilution method to prevent hemoconcentration in the dialyzer. And it is important to keep the blood flow at about 200 ml per minute or higher to prevent the stasis of the blood and the rise of anticoagulation. Regional anticoagulation with glutamine reversal actually is a historical method now, but I will uh, mention its main idea. Its main idea that when the blood is came out of the patient, they introduce a very high dose of heparin to anticoagulate the uh, blood. Then, when the blood is coming back to the patient, they administer the antidote of heparin, which is protamine, so to combine with heparin and neutralize the heparin. But actually, this is technically difficult and rebound leading two to four hours after the end of the dialysis had been occurred. This is because the heparin protein complex that enters the patient's body is uh, slipped away heparin protein by the reticular endothelial system, which will elevate the heparin level in the patient's body and lead to catastrophic bleeding. One of the uh, methods of heparin related anticoagulation is heparin coated filter. Actually, this is under studies and experiments. Many studies used heparin coated filter without systemic anticoagulation, and uh, the results are not good. The coated membranes were associated with a significantly increased incidence on brain clotting, and they are not recommended. Regarding citrate related anticoagulation, the main ideas. Regional citrate anticoagulation. The main idea depends on this is an intrinsic and extrinsic pathway of coagulation. One of the most important playmakers for coagulation in our body is calcium. So if I block the calcium, I will prevent the clotting. This is the main idea of the regional citrate anticoagulation. This is our patient. When the blood comes out from the patient, we introduce citrate. Citrate chelate free anise the calcium. So the clotting system or clotting mechanism will not work out. It is important that these patients will have hypocalcemia. So I have to replace calcium for the patient to compensate the chelated calcium with 
Okay. And the important issue that citrate that will enter the patient's body, the anticoagulants that are used, citrate is metabolized the primary in the liver to bicarbonate, so there is a risk of alkalemia. So I have to decrease the analysis solution bicarbonate in this method. What are the major problems in regional citrate anticoagulation? Hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia if the replacement is less or more than what I need. Hypernatremia in both the citrate is in the form of hypertonic sodium citrate. And metabolic alkalosis, as we said, that citrate is metabolized to bicarbonate. Regarding this complex methodology of citrate, but if we compare the regional citrate for a separate anticoagulation, you will find that regional citrate anticoagulation reviews the bleeding risk more than heparin anticoagulation. Regional citrate anticoagulation has similar or better efficacy on circuit patency. Regional citrate anticoagulation reduces neutrophil and the complement activation that extracorporeal circuit. That is why KDU guidelines recommend regional citrate anticoagulation as the primary used method for all patients with risk of bleeding or without risk of bleeding if they are acute kidney injury with systemic disorder or systemic disease or uh, hemodynamically unstable, especially even if the, there is high risk of bleeding or not. So it is widely used for CRRT but not intermittent hemodynamics. So although this, in my city, Alexandria, there is only one center using regional citrate anticoagulation. It is very difficult to use, and I, I don't think that it is. Uh, here also in the Eurogen uh, Center, there is experience for regional citrate anticoagulation. Citrazate, it is a bicarbonate dialysis solution with low concentration of citrazate citrate. It is uh, actually under study, and uh, there is no uh, good results regarding its use till now. Heparinoids, these are not heparin or citrate related heparinoids. Say, for example, danabrinoid and fundabarinox are anticoagulants blocking activated factor 10. The most important disadvantage of these drugs, they have a very long half life in real impairment patients. So there is a high risk of bleeding, and their primary use in hemodialysis patients is in the management of heparin induced thrombocytopenia. When I can't use heparin, I can use one of those, and you will find the details in the lectures that I announced related to heparin induced thrombocytopenia. Other drugs are direct thrombin inhibitors, as argatroban, liveridine, which is not present now, replaced by recombinant uridine and bifadiridine are antithrombin factors. Again, the most important side effect is that they have prolonged half-life in our patients and their primary use is the management of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Finally, platelet inhibiting agents, they uh, mainly prostacycline. <coughs> there are no only limited clinical experience with prostacycline and a few published reports of its safety and efficacy. To collect my talk, anticoagulation selection, the first which we talked about is routine, unfractionated heparin with constant infusion, can be used in intermittent hemodialysis, CRRT, but the patient bleeding risk must be no risk. Routine, unfractionated heparin, followed by boluses or no boluses, can be used for intermittent hemodialysis, can be used for CRRT, it is important that the patient bleeding risk is zero. Tight minimum dose heparin with constant infusion can be used for intermittent hemodialysis, CRRT. Its patient's bleeding risk must be slight minimum. Low molecular weight heparin can be used in intermittent hemodialysis and CRRT, but it is not widely used in CRRT and there is limited experience. It is important that the patient has no risk for bleeding. Heparin free dialysis can be used in intermittent hemodialysis, CRRT, with any risk of bleeding, slight, moderate, or high. Regional anticoagulation with glutamine reversal, it is not used any anywhere. Heparin coated filter, it is under experimental studies and is not recommended. Regional citrate anticoagulation is recommended only for CRRT and it is used or can be used with any patient's bleeding risk. Citrazate is not recommended till now, it is under experimental studies. Hibarinoids can be used in intermittent hemodialysis CRRT and its primary use is 
for the management of people induced thrombocytopenia, thrombin inhibitors are the same as heparinoids, and finally, blood inhibiting agents are not recommended till now. This is the website that contains the literature of heparin induced thrombocytopenia, www.nephrotubecd.com, and it contains many multiple lectures related to nephrology, and thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohamed Abdul for this excellent presentation and the practical uh, presentation. And very comprehensive, include a lot of ways to anticoagulate the extracorporeal circulation. Now it's over for questions. Questions? Yes, please. The mic, please. I just want to share some practical advice. Back at home, we have a problem when it comes to the use of the graft, AV graft, which we are in human people. Whether we use heparin or normal graft, heparin is There's always a problem of floating in the human patients using grafts. I don't know if there's anything extra that can be done in self. Management of elderly patients that have AV graft. So it's now my pleasure. 